Right. So, so we're well underway with Project 4. Uh, we had the Task 1 deadline today, which uh, overall went really well. So I'm, I'm happy with the way things are going here. Um, we did linked lists. We wrote these methods. Trees, uh, this one's going really well too. If, if you haven't done this one yet, it is the easiest task of the semester. Uh, once you understand what's asked of you, it's really easy to write this code. Uh, don't overthink this one. Um, trees, you're navigating that decision tree, going left or right based on the make decision method, and then calling the action method to uh, return the action if make decision returns zero. Today we want to talk about graphs and BFS pathfinding. So what we want to do is find the distance between two players or two grid locations in this game while avoiding walls. So we wrote one method to compute paths already where, uh, where you just blatantly ignore walls. Uh, most soon solutions and my solution, you go in either the X or the Y direction until that coordinate matches and then go in the other direction and just plow through any walls that might be in your way and just it's whatever. Uh, and that's what you're asked to do for that. Just to get used to building a linked list is what that task is all about. Yeah. There's something that tells you that a location is a wall? Yes. Okay. Yes, there is. Um, so we want to so we want to find that distance while avoiding walls to figure out the distance of the shortest path. I will get around to that in more detail. Uh, to find the distance between two grid locations while avoiding walls. So if there's a wall in the way, the distance, you'd have to go around that wall to figure out how, uh, how far away it is. And the application objective is finding the path, finally, to be able to actually navigate from uh, from one location to another, and closest player while avoiding walls. So the idea is the AI characters are going to find the closest player to them and then find their way to that player. So they'll attack whoever's closest to them as long as they're within range. And they have some, uh, some fixed range of calling the distance. If the distance is less than, uh, of the closest player is less than some value, then it's going to hunt that player uh, by using this get path to get the path that avoids walls from their location to the other AI, uh, the other player's location, either AI or human controlled. So that's what we want to build today. Oh, I, I never talked about this, but there are a lot of testing tips. If you ask me about testing and you haven't gone through these tips, uh, I'll probably just point those out to you. But uh, this is what we want to build, all this avoiding walls stuff. I don't even have the project open. AI. So the question, how do we tell what's a wall and what's not? There is this get graph, level, level to graph. Well, let's just find it. In the AI game state class, you can know where all the walls are. So if you want to build your own graph, you can get the wall locations from this data structure when you have the AI game state object. And I provide this level as graph method which is going to take this level, uh, read all of the state variables, read the wall locations, et cetera, and return a graph that's going to have each grid location as a node as long as that grid location is not a wall. And then it's going to connect any two adjacent non-wall grid locations in the, uh, the up-down, left, right directions, in the cardinal directions. So this will return your graph that's able to represent, that does represent the game board. And in this method, I use this grid ID, this uh, way of converting a grid location into an ID, which is going to take the Y coordinate times the level width plus the X coordinate. This is a way to give me a unique ID for every single grid location. Any X, Y you give me, I have a unique ID for it. And then that's what the ID is in the graph. So every node needs a unique ID. I'm using that formula to be able to generate those IDs. So when you need to find the distance between two grid locations, take each grid location, apply this function, y times the level width plus x, to get its ID 
So you have the ID of the start, the ID of the end, and then run your breadth first search on those IDs to find your paths, your distances, etc. And this will be a graph of grid location. So to go from those IDs back to a grid location, ask the graph. The graph has a map of IDs to grid locations. Ask the map, hey, what is the actual value for this ID? And it'll give you the grid location. Any questions on this? Is that? And you don't, like I recommend you read through this and see exactly what's going on here. Uh, but it does, as long as you understand what this is doing, that it's returning a graph, where a graph of grid location, where each ID of the node is the grid location based on this function, that's its ID. And there's only an edge between two nodes if it's a valid move on the game board. That's the only time you have an edge between any two nodes. If it's an up, down, left, right move, and neither of them are walls, and it doesn't go off the edge of the map. Uh, which I, I have a border around the map to avoid that situation anyway, but that wouldn't be in this graph. If we had a, a valid node that's not a wall on the edge of the map, that needs to be excluded as well. Uh, so that's what all this code is doing, is building that graph. I used to have students write this code, and it's just an exercise on tedium. Uh, it doesn't help you understand graphs as much as I wanted it to, so I give you this code and uh, have you write the code that does the cool stuff. Any questions on that? That's a good question. I have to make sure I show this in the next lecture, too. So we need to figure out how to do this stuff. We briefly talked about breadth, breadth first search last time. Uh, now let's dive into it in more detail, see it run a few times, go through uh, with a lot more explanation. The goal of today's lecture is to get you to be able to write task three and the application objective. You'd be able to do both of those after today's lecture. And then uh, Friday is going to be mostly or exclusively testing for task three. Uh, today's the last day of actual content in the course. Yay. Yay. All right, so let's, uh, let's get into it. Uh, so path, just a reminder, uh, a path in a graph is a list of nodes where any two adjacent nodes are connected by an edge. So this is a valid path going from Lincoln that lost its N, apparently. Lincoln, MIT, Utah, SDC, RAND, UCSB, SRI. That's a path in this graph. And its length is the number of edges in that path. So the number of edges in the path is its length. One, two, three, four, five, six edges. Even though the path has seven nodes, the length is going to be, uh, is going to be six. So keep that in mind when you're returning your distance. For task three, you return the distance as an int. That's the number of edges in that path. So if you get your list, your path is going to be a list of nodes, a list of grid locations in the game. And if you return the length of that list, you're going to be off by one. So just be careful about that. It's the number of edges or the length of that list minus one, because that is a list of nodes, not a list of edges. So keep that in mind. That's the length of a path. And we got one more definition to throw at you. Distance between two nodes is the length of the shortest path, or at least one of the shortest paths between two nodes. So the distance between Lincoln and SRI, even though we saw this path connecting the two, there's a shorter path. If I go to MIT, Utah, SRI, I can find a path of length three. And as much as we stare at this graph, we're not going to find a path of length two or one. Uh, we're never going to find a path less than length three from Lincoln to SRI. So the distance between Lincoln and SRI is three. Uh, so this is the definition, the distance between two grid locations in the map. That's the definition we're using for task three, is the length of one of the minimum length paths connecting those two grid locations. That's our distance, that's our measure of distance, which the length of the path is the number of edges. So how many, 
uh, how many moves would an AI have to make if it were like a, a discrete grid? How many moves would the AI have to take in, uh, to get from one location to another if they take the minimal amount of moves possible? That's what we want to do for task three. RAND and BBN, they're connected by an edge. So they're going to have distance one. The length of the shortest path is one. It's just traverse the edge. And we want to use breadth first search to find the distance between two nodes and eventually find the shortest path, the actual paths, instead of just the distance. Uh, like I said, I said this a bunch of times. I'll say at least one more time right now. Uh, the code is pretty similar to find distance. You have to run breadth first search, a modified version of breadth first search to add some bookkeeping. Uh, to find distance as it is for finding the actual shortest path or the closest player. Uh, it's all the same thing. I mean, closest player is going through all the players and running your distance code and just tracking them in. Uh, and then pathfinding, you find the distance, but instead of returning the distance, you return the actual path that you found for that distance. You have to find that path anyway to find its length. So returning the path isn't much extra work. So if you're going to do task three, which I, I've, all of you will be doing, um, at this point, nobody's, you, you can't come this far and fail this class all the way at the last task. Please don't do that. Um, but, but, uh, but you're going to finish task three. Uh, finish it with enough time so you can get this application objective two and pad your grade a little bit. Uh, don't leave that application objective on the table because you're doing most of the work for it for task three anyway. Get this application objective. Don't do task three right at the deadline and not leave yourself time to get that extra AO. Uh, get that extra AO. Or use a, a recovery opportunity on task three <coughs> and then not have time for the AO. Uh, so we're going to do breadth first search again. We did a very quick, very high level uh, view of breadth first search. I just had that box that expanded. And the question you should have is, how the hell am I going to code that? How am I going to write code for this? And I'll, I'll say this. I wasn't going to say this, but I, I might as well, in fairness. Um, Paul did go through the code for breadth first search. So if you want to watch his lectures uh, from this morning, um, you can get some, some code, some help with the coding for breadth first search. I'm going to show you all the conceptual uh, and visual on the slides to be, able to, uh, to be able to run this algorithm. But we want to run breadth first search, but actually track some information, not just explore nodes, not just find connected components, um, but actually code this up and get some information out of this. Breadth first search gives us a lot of useful information. How are we going to get it out of this? So one, what's the information that it gives us? Let's run through breadth first search. And I am going to start not at UCLA this time. Let's start at Carnegie. And when I run breadth first search, each time I explore a new node, I'm going to visually draw it lower on this slide. So I'm going to start Carnegie right at the top. And whenever I explore a node, I'm going to draw it visually lower. And I'm going to keep the edges that I used to find those new nodes. So Carnegie is going to find Case and Harvard, and I'm going to draw them visually below Carnegie. Case is going to find Lincoln. Harvard's going to find BBN. I'm going to keep those edges and draw them visually below the node that found them. One of those two is going to find MIT. For our purposes, we can break the ties arbitrarily. Either one of these two nodes could discover MIT. So I could either do Lincoln to MIT or BBN to MIT. And then Rand has to be discovered through BBN. Uh, I chose Lincoln to discover BBN just so it balances my tree a little better. Oh, spoilers, it's going to be a tree. Uh, MIT is going to discover Utah. Rand is discovering SDC, UCSB, and UCLA. So we keep those edges. One of these three nodes is going to discover SRI, and UCLA is going to discover Stanford. So all I did was, as I was traversing this graph, I'm keeping the edges that I traveled when I was running breadth first search. And I end up with this data structure over here, which will be a tree. It's not a binary tree like we saw last week, but it is going to be a tree because it has no cycles. No cycles. A graph with no cycles is a tree. So it's effectively this graph with any of these edges that we didn't use 
all removed. It's the same graph, but with some missing edges. And the way I drew this visually with all the nodes going down, we get some levels to this thing. So if visually I take, I see these as each time I went across an edge, I go down and I decide to label those starting at zero. So Carnegie is level zero. And whenever I go down visually, level one, two, three, four, five. The level number is exactly the distance from the starting node to that node. So level three, RAND and MIT, the distance from Carnegie to either one of these nodes is three. And in fact, the path that we took to discover them is one of, you know, we broke ties arbitrarily, but at least one of the shortest paths from the start node to that node. So if I go Carnegie, Case, Lincoln, MIT, Carnegie, Harvard, BBN, RAND, those are the shortest paths to get from Carnegie to either one of those nodes. In SRI Stanford, there's no possible way, if we look at the original graph, there's no possible way to get from Carnegie to SRI or Stanford in fewer than five moves. There's no path that exists shorter than length five. And what breadth first search guarantees is that if there were a path shorter than length five, Breadth first search would have found it earlier. If there were a shorter path of length four, they would be up on this level. And it would have been discovered earlier. So when we have the expanding, like we start at distance zero, if we have the expanding box, we can kind of visualize this where we're going to say, OK, what are all of the nodes that I can reach through one edge? That's Case and Herbert. Those are all of the nodes that I can reach with distance one because they're exactly the nodes that are connected by an edge. And if I explore all the nodes that they can find through distance one, and they themselves are distance one, then those next nodes must have distance two to Carnegie because they were discovered through nodes that I know have distance one because they're connected by an edge and they were connected by those, to those nodes by distance one because they're connected by an edge, so they must have distance two. So I have these as my distance two nodes. Those are the ones we're going to explore the neighbors of next. So any nodes connected to them must have distance three. Any nodes connected to them that haven't been explored already are distance four, and finally distance five. Breath first search finds the shortest pass between those nodes. And of course, there are multiple shortest paths. MIT could also be discovered this way, but it's still distance three, it's still a path of length three. You'll always find the shortest paths doing this. And the ties, you don't care. And this is why we love breadth first search. This is why we don't really like depth first search, at least in 116. I'm not going to talk about depth first search, which is similar to this. Uh, we don't get this kind of information out of it. Breadth first search gives us this really nice information of distances in the graph. But not quite yet. Are any questions about that? By the way, it looks like chat's covered. We, we do have to track the explored edges. Bless you. Uh, we do have to track the explored edges. So we're going to go through this a few more times. Don't you worry. We're going uh, to reinforce this all day. Uh, but any questions on this so far? Because you still ha should have the question of, how the hell do I code that? Uh, we're still getting there. But other than that, everybody get an idea of what needs to be coded? I'll take that as a maybe. Let me see your next example. Maybe it'll make sense. So we need to keep track of all this information. We got, and to do this, 
I want to use three different data structures. I want three data structures which are going to give me the information, store the information that I need to be able to run through breadth first search. So I got one, which is going to be a queue. This queue is, the, is very important. This is probably the one where it would take a, at least a little bit of time to come up with on your own. A queue of the nodes that we're going to explore the neighbors of, or I'll just say the nodes we're going to explore. I kind of overload the term explore when I'm, when I'm using this. Uh, but the nodes, I'll use visited because that's what I put in the slide. The nodes that we're going to visit, and whenever we visit that node, we're going to explore all of its neighbors. We initialize this at our starting node. So if you need to find the distance between two grid locations in the map, one of those two is your starting node. And then the other one, you need to find the distance from the starting node to that other node. The distances are going to be symmetric, so either one, you, you could start at your end for your breadth for search, that's fine too. But you choose one of them for your starting node. When you choose a starting node, you're going to mark it as explored. I'll get to that one in a second. We're going to initialize this data structure. We'll get to that in a second. But we're going to add it to our queue to mark this as we need to visit this node. We need to go check all of its neighbors and check out its neighbors of this node. So we add it to the queue to keep track of the nodes that we need to visit. We have some data structure. Paul used the set today, which he regrets. He used the set because he stole it from me because he got my code. Uh, but any data structure that you would like to use, probably not a tree because you probably don't like using trees, but you could um, if you want to learn more about trees for sure. Um, Scala has a built-in set, so if you want a data structure that doesn't allow duplicates, set is there for you, and it's pretty efficient lookups. So if a set contains something, that's an efficient operation. I'm not too concerned about efficiency in this class, but it is pretty handy. Uh, or an array list, you know, use whatever you want to track, but the goal of this data structure is to track which nodes have been explored. In my data structure here, I'm going to mark those nodes in orange. So orange means it's been explored. Green means it has not been explored. So orange means it's in your data structure. I like to use a set, and Paul's example uses a set where whenever you explore a node, you add it to the set, and to check if it's explored, you check if that set contains that node. And whenever I say node, we're working in IDs. The, the idea of the graph is to work with those integer IDs. So all of this is a set of ints, works with IDs, integer IDs. I'm exploring a node, so when I initialize for my starting node, add that starting node to the set, and then whenever I'm about to explore a node, I'm going to check, is this node already explored? Yeah. Does this set contain this ID? If it does, we don't explore it. If it does not, we do explore it. So data structure of your choice to track the explored nodes. And finally, one last data structure, which is going to store the distance from the starting node to each node. In this, you hopefully you can tell visually, this is going to be a map, would be the data structure of choice here. And I'm going to initialize the starting node to zero. It has distance zero to get from a node to itself. I mean, we don't have to do anything. We're already there. And then initialize everything else to whatever, or just don't put them in the map at all until they're explored. Uh, visually, I'm going to initialize them all to infinity. Um, which for some reason I got circles around my infinity symbols. I think that's you know, somehow uh, when I was making the slide that uh, the artifact came about. But anyway, just uh, some placeholders until we start populating this thing. So those are the three data structures we're going to use. And then as we go through the algorithm, we're going to update these three data structures to be able to get the job done, to be able to run this breadth first search while remembering the distance from the starting node to every node in the graph. So in the end, these numbers here should match what we did on the previous example, except in the previous example I said, draw the nodes visually lower on the slide. Well, how do you do that in code? This is how we're going to do it in code, is with a map. This map is going to store the distance from starting node to each node or store that level that we saw in the previous slide. So instead of drawing visually lower, 
we're going to increment the values each time we discover a new node. So let's see this thing in action. Carnegie, we're not looking visually here because we're not going to have any visuals when we're coding, but we're looking at our queue. We're going to dequeue from our queue. Whatever's at the front of the queue, and Scala has a built-in queue. I recommend just using Scala's built-in one. Uh, it has a mutable queue. You can just use that. Uh, a bunch of students are, and I got that question a few times. So we're going to go to the front of the queue, dequeue, grab this value, and explore all of its neighbors. So when we explore the neighbors, we're going to go to our adjacency list, which is a fourth data structure, not shown. We use a lot of data structures for this. We're deep in the data structures and algorithms uh, LO, so we should expect that. Uh, we're going to explore Carnegie. We go, to our, we go to our adjacency list, find all of the neighbors of Carnegie. That's going to give us Case and Harvard. For each neighbor, we're going to check has this neighbor already been explored? If it has, don't do a damn thing. Don't touch it. It's already explored. Who cares? If it has not been explored, then we get to visit it for the first time. We get to go to this node. Nobody's ever seen this node before. We're going to go to this node. When we visit a node, and the order is arbitrary here. They're both on the same level, so we're okay with that. When we visit a node, we're going to add it to our queue. We're going to enqueue it. And we're going to go to our distances map and set its distance to the distance of the node that explored it plus one. So case and Harvard, our order is arbitrary. It could be Harvard then case or case then Harvard. But they're enqueued into our queue. And we know their distances. Both their distances are one. That's what we would expect. So we're feeling good about that. Now we dequeue whatever's in the front of the queue again and just repeat the process until the queue's empty. So if you're writing the code here, this is a good application of a while loop. Well, queue is not empty. Keep doing this thing. So we're going to dequeue case, explore all of its neighbors that are not explored. So we're going to check Carnegie. Look up in our data structure, say, have we explored Carnegie? That data structure is going to say, yeah, Carnegie's already in this data structure. It's already been explored, so we do nothing. When we discover Lincoln, we're discovering this for the first time. So we add it to the queue. It's a queue, so it's going to be after Harvard. And we're going to update its distance. It was explored through a node of distance 1. So its distance is going to be 2. So whenever we explore a node, we're saying the node whose neighbors we're exploring, give me its distance, pull that from the map, and then the nodes that we're exploring, its neighbors that have not already been explored, add them to the map with that value plus 1. Because we found them by traveling one more edge, so it has to be one more distance from the node, from the starting node, than the node that explored it. This was distance one from Carnegie. This has to be distance two. Okay, DQ Harvard. And the way we're using a queue here, we're going to explore all of the level one nodes before any of the level two nodes all of the, or distance, I should say distance at this point, all of the distance two nodes before any distance three nodes, we're going to get them in the order that's going to find us the shortest paths. So we get Harvard is going to discover BBN, enqueue it, update its distance, check on Carnegie. Carnegie's already been explored, so we do nothing. We're visiting every node exactly once. This is going to get us our distances and also give us that um, avoiding infinite, uh, avoiding going infinite. If we keep revisiting nodes, we're going to go infinite real quick. We're avoiding that by only visiting every node exactly once. And then we happen to be done with both distance one nodes. 
And look at that, the front of our queue has a distance two node. Now we're gonna do all distance two nodes, all two of them, before we get any distance three nodes at the front of the queue. How do we know when going through our queue that is moved on to the next level? Uh, you kinda don't, and you kinda don't care. So when we dequeue Lincoln, we don't really, we don't necessarily know that we moved from level one to two. That's just, I'm just explaining that so, uh, just so we know, just, you know, as a little extra so we know what's going on. But when you dequeue Lincoln, just the way breadth first search works, it will be after all of the level two nodes. But we're going to look it up in our map. That's how we're going to know that we moved on to a new level, is we dequeue a node, we look it up in our map, and this has distance two. So whenever we DQ, we're gonna read its distance from this map. It's a two. So we do know that we've reached level two. We generally don't necessarily care, but we wanna make sure we pull the right number from the map. So now anything we discover from Lincoln is going to have one added to that. So anything we discover through Lincoln has to be a distance three node. Lincoln is gonna check case and do nothing. It's gonna check MIT and in Q MIT and MIT is going to have a distance three. So the choice between does Lincoln discover MIT or does BBN discover MIT really depended on the order in which we enqueued Case and Harvard when we discovered Carnegie. And that order is going to be arbitrary and it's going to be decided by the, just what order they happen to show up in in your adjacency list. So the adjacency list is going to kind of make that arbitrary decision for you. You iterate over your list of neighbors just whatever one happens to be first happens to be added to the queue and discovered first. But in the code, it just washes out and you really don't have to think about it. You never in your code have to code those arbitrary decisions. They just kind of happen. BBN is at the front of the queue. BBN is going to discover RAND. It's going to check MIT and do nothing. It's going to check Harvard and do nothing because they're already explored. They're already in our explored data structure. But we do explore RAND, BBN, we look up a distance of two, pop it up by one, and RAND has a distance three. And we just keep going until this queue is empty. MIT is going to discover Utah. Lincoln and BBN were already explored, so we don't do anything. Utah was not explored, it's not in our explored data structure. So Utah, we're gonna read the distance of MIT from this map, look it up in the map, it's three. Pop it up by one, Utah has to have distance four. We got Rand, Rand's got a lot of work to do. RAND's going to check BBN, it's already explored, but three nodes that are not explored, they all need to be enqueued, and they're all going to have distance four because RAND had distance three. So we're going to add one to its, their distances. Yeah, and Terry, exactly. Uh, if, so if, you, if we use the stack instead of a queue, we got depth first search. So we're not going to talk about it in 116, but you'll talk about that in one uh, in CC 250. The big difference between depth first and breadth first stack instead of a queue, which I'd like to do. Uh, we get to talk about recursion and stacks. I'd like to do it as an application of stacks, but I just can't find a good way to make depth first search interesting in a homework assignment. Uh, there's no reason for you to run depth first search um, that I found an interesting way to use it. Um, but I would like to do that as an application of stack and uh, the recursion. Do we use a while loop to iterate over the queue? Yeah. I explicitly said that. I said that. Uh, so this is a great, I said this is a great application of a while loop. Well, the queue is not empty. Keep doing the, all this stuff that I'm saying. Po uh, DQ, explore the unexplored neighbors and then update your distances and enqueue the neighbors that you newly discovered. And then you go back to the top of the loop. Is the queue empty? No, do it again. Is the queue empty? No, pop the, you know, DQ, do it again. Do that until this queue is empty. Once the queue is empty, 
you're done with that loop, and you're ready to compute your distance between the start and end node. Yeah? If you then explore the neighbors, wouldn't it stop right after you do Carnegie? By, by itself? No. Uh, so if you DQ and then explore the neighbors, so you're going to check, is the queue empty? If the answer is no, you're going to DQ. The queue might be empty at that point, but you're not going to check it again until you explore the neighbors and add things back to the queue. You're not going to break in the middle of the loop if the condition is false. You're only checking the condition when you get back to the top of the loop. What happened if you modified a for loop as it's iterating over elements in it? You mean modify the data structure that you're iterating over? Things break. Well, if there's only one way and the node is already explored, will the distance change? If there's only one way to get to a node, it's only going to, it'll be explored, it'll only be considered to be explored one time just through that one edge that's going to explore it and it'll be explored on that time and never be considered again so the distance wouldn't end up updating uh, but if you modify a data structure as you're iterating over it things break is the short answer to that don't ever do that it breaks so much stuff uh, with the queue our we're not actually iterating over the queue if we do a well the queue is not empty we're not modifying the data structure as we're iterating over it but we're checking if the data structure is empty as the condition. So it's not a for value in queue. It's a, well, the queue is not empty. So we're not actually iterating over the queue. We're kind of are, but we're doing it manually. So it's OK that the queue is changing as we're working with it. But if we had like a list, if I said 4x in list, and inside the loop I was modifying the list, it, you know, things don't necessarily break, but it's just asking for bugs. It's a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, that's one reason, another reason why we like immutable data structures. You're iterating over them. You don't have to worry about the data structure changing as you're iterating over it. Uh, those are tough bugs to find. I've seen a lot of those bugs, and uh, they're always, always painful. Wait, yes? Did I not understand? Maybe I misunderstood the question. What if there's only one way and the node is already explored? Will the distance change? I, I don't think the, the, these distances are never going to change. Once you have a distance in this map, it shouldn't change. Because these nodes are all explored now, so we're never going to explore them again. They're already in your explored data set. And we only update this map when a node is first explored. Yeah, if it changed, we wouldn't find shortest paths anymore. All right, so let's DQ Utah. We're going to find SRI. We're going to ignore SDC, ignore MIT, because they're already explored. SRI goes to the end. SRI has distance 5. UCLA, we're going to find Stanford. Again, distance 5, because UCLA is 4. Ignore SRI, ignore UCSB, ignore RAND. And we still have four nodes in our queue ready to be explored, ready for its, their neighbors to be considered. But all of their neighbors are explored, just every node's explored already. So UCSB, we are going to check all these neighbors. They're all explored, so we don't end up doing anything. We do DQ SDC, all of its neighbors are explored, we don't do anything. SRI, all of its neighbors are explored, we don't do anything. Stanford, all of its neighbors are explored, we don't do anything. And finally, our queue is empty, and we're done. Q is empty, the loop ends, and we're on with our day. Now we have the distance from the starting node to any node in our graph. We started with one node, our grid location of our, our start node. We say, OK, grid location of my end node. What's your distance? And whatever it is in the map, return that. Minus, minus one, or no, not minus one even. Uh, return that, and that's it. That's task three. So after the loop, you're just looking up the end node in your data structure and returning whatever number you have there. Because you computed the distance from the start node to any node from that starting grid location to every grid location on the game board. So just look up the end node and return it.
Questions on this? Okay, distance is cool, but you know, for the application objective, we need paths. We need actual paths. How are we going to do this? Well, let me show you one trick that's going to solve this for you. Instead of remembering the distance from each node, uh, from the starting node to each node, I'm going to make one subtle change here. I'm going to track the node that explored it, the index specifically in our code, the index of the node that explored that node. The starting node is going to have some special index. I like to use negative 1, something to denote that it's a start node that's not going to be a valid ID of any node in your graph. And then each time you explore a node, store the index for the node that explored it. Harvard and Case were explored through Carnegie. Lincoln is explored through Case. BBN was explored through Harvard. MIT was explored through Lincoln. RAND was explored through BBN. And just keep doing that. Track the node that discovered it, not the distance. This gives us a lot more information. So now every node knows the previous node, the node that explored it. How does this help us? Well, say we're trying to find the shortest path from Carnegie to Stanford. I'm going to start at my end node. And if I keep going backwards using this map, I should end up at my start node. So I'm going to start at Stanford. That's my last node in my chain, in my list, in my path. Stanford's going to be the last node in my path. And I'm going to say, hey, Stanford, who discovered you? UCLA discovered me. UCLA, who discovered you? Rand discovered me. So that's the next or the previous link in my path, and I'm going to keep going backwards till I end up at the starting node. Rand, who discovered you? Well, BBN did. So I'm going to prepend. I think in linked list, I'm going to prepend. BBN, who discovered you? Harvard, prepend. Harvard, who discovered you? Carnegie, prepend. Carnegie, who discovered you? I'm the start node. Therefore, our path is done. Shortest path from Carnegie to Stanford is this path right here. At least a shortest path. I think this is the unique shortest path for this specific example. Right? Yeah, I think this is, this is too long. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is the unique shortest path in this case. So you change your data structure to instead of storing the distance and initializing to zero, you store the index of the node that discovered it. And then once you get your end <laughs> node, you have your end node, look up where it came from and just keep prepending a linked list. That's your path, return that path. Not too much different from finding the distance itself. So once you have task three, either change your data structure or write another method, you know, do the old cut and paste and then modify it to do this. Store the nodes instead of the just raw distances. Uh, personally, I modified it to do this, and then my uh, and then my distance code becomes compute the path, then length minus one. Uh, I just use the same code. Yeah, it's not random. There will be multiple shortest paths. We'll get one of those shortest paths, and we just don't care which one. Like since they're both shortest paths, like does it matter if I get to MIT this way or this way? If they're both shortest paths, then we don't care. And MIT will still have the same distance. So when MIT gets to Utah, whether MIT was distance 3 this way or distance 3 this way, Utah is still distance 4. It doesn't matter how we break those ties. You know, it might matter for specific applications. Maybe you want to add some logic uh, to break those ties not arbitrarily for our purposes, we don't care. If the AI goes this way instead of this way, I don't care, as long as it finds that shortest path. It only finds a shortest path. So like if you have an AI here attacking a player up here diagonally, there's a lot of different paths to be able to get to there. And that's why our testing has to accept any of those shortest paths. Uh, we don't care which one as long as it's taking a shortest path. Yeah. 
Uh, isn't that the edge between SRI and UCLA isn't explored? Is like, will it know that the shortest path is just one move between SRI and UCLA? Yes, it To from SRA to UCLA, yeah. it it won't know about that path because neither of those were a starting node. So we're only finding the shortest path from the starting node to any node in the graph. So if we want to find this edge and know that SRI and UCLA have distance one, one of these two, we would rerun the algorithm with one of those two as the starting node. And then the first thing they would do is find each other and have distance one. Uh, but we don't get arbitrary information for any two nodes by running the graph. We have to choose our starting node carefully. All right, we kind of started with this, so I lose my, my punchline here. But how the hell do those graphs help us with this? This is what we actually have to work with, is this game board. So how do these graphs help us? Well, we have the level as graph method, so you know what, what, the, what that is. But we're going to convert the level to a graph, and then use breadth first search on this graph. So the level of the graph takes that game board, takes all the information of the walls and everything, and generates a node for every uh, passable, uh, every grid location that a player can occupy, and then create edges between any valid moves between them. You start, maybe you're right here at the start node, and you want to find the shortest path to, <coughs> to here. You should be able to run breadth first search and find this path to be able to get to that location. So we, as humans, we see this game board, but all of your AI players, they're going to see this graph. With multiple connected components, they're going to stay on this connected component because they're not going to go through walls. And that's how they're going to navigate is their location is one of these nodes, their target is one of the other nodes, and they're going to run breadth first search to be able to find exactly how to get from point A to point B with the shortest path. Yeah. If we're creating that path based on adjacent available nodes, would mm -hmm. it even mark the isolated triangles that are there? Like, would it? I mean, we don't have to. Technically, my code does is why, why I added them on this slide. Uh, but they effectively, these triangles effectively don't really exist. An AI player is never going to consider them. They're never going to be visited by breath first search. So they don't matter whether they're there or not. Uh, I added them on the slide just because my code does add them. Come on. If Stanford was attached to SRA, oh, I forget my. That would be length six. I forget the graph where Stanford and SRA were. I thought Stanford and SRA were connected by a edge. Okay, Stanford and SRA are connected by an edge. Oh, yeah, it, so my answer over there answered that question. And have a great day. I'll see everyone Friday.